Chicago to LA. Most people won't understand this, but I love motorcycles. Probably because I grew up with them. My father was a stunt driver. He was also a railroad engineer and airplane pilot. He mastered a transportation system that was based on cheap oil. But that's all going to change soon because we've already used up half the world's oil supply. The easy half. Don't take my word for it. Take the word of a major oil company. The first trillion barrels of oil were cheap. The second trillion will be expensive. World consumption will double in the next 20 years while production declines. And the price of oil will skyrocket. Some say running out of oil will be a good thing. We'll stop polluting the earth, our health will improve, and it will help diminish climate change. But a world with oil shortages will be catastrophic if we're not prepared for it. And all indications are, we won't be. We also won't be prepared for other catastrophic developments that are related to our use of oil. The seeds of those events were planted during my lifetime, and they will bear fruit during the lifetimes of our children. Oil provided an energy boost to our civilization that has been unmatched in human history and allowed us to create the society we know today. Oil is the most taken for granted resource we have ever had. A single barrel contains the energy equivalent of 25,000 hours of human labor. But this cheap and powerful source of energy also carries with it the seeds of our own destruction. The story of oil began hundreds of millions of years ago. The end of that story will begin when today's young children are in the middle of their lives. As I ride into the future, I wonder what kind of world these children will grow into and how different it will be from mine. I was born just after World War II. From an early age, I always wandered off by myself. One time I wandered into an alley where a homeless man took care of me. I lived with him for two days. My mother rewarded that unfortunate man. I only wish I could have thanked him later in life. My mom had to put a harness on me, just like a dog, to keep me from running off. Despite my wandering feet, she taught me to walk to school by myself. She also taught my sisters. Few parents would do that today. By the sixth grade, I had a whole group of friends that I loved. Jake used to eat his boogers, so we made fun of him. We called him Lunch Nose. Hey, Lunch Nose! Then there was Foster. He was always stealing things from other kids and he'd throw temper tantrums whenever he couldn't get his way. These days he would have a temper dysregulation disorder and be given a drug instead of a good spanking. Foster lied to everyone about everything. He must have been pretty smart to keep track of all those lies. He wanted to be a millionaire. I thought he was a little nuts. Then there was Nick, the school bully. He would beat up on everyone after school. Especially David, who was shy. One day when Nick was beating up on David, I came to David's defense. Then Nick beat up both of us. Bill was our class president. He talked too much. He once talked me into taking a puff of a cigarette after school. He thought it was cool. That was the biggest drug around schools back then. Things are different today. My parents let me sleep out in the backyard with friends, or sometimes even alone. 
I remember staring up at the stars and wondering what life was all about, what we humans were doing here on Earth. I never felt very comfortable when I did that. I grew up in an age of innocence. My first memory of a president was Dwight D. Eisenhower. He was a good man. We trusted him. We trusted our government. The government would never lie to us. At least that's what I was taught in civics class. I never understood why other people wanted to bomb us, but I was reminded with our duck and cover drills. I always thought they were stupid, like my desk was going to protect me from an atomic bomb. My parents even built a bomb shelter. It became my secret hideaway. One day, I invited Peggy, a girl from class, to come with me. It was so dark she got excited and started kissing me. She even tried to stick her tongue down my throat. Girls were so disgusting back then. My parents watched Lawrence Welk every Saturday night. And my mom forced me to take accordion lessons. I hated Lawrence Welk. In high school, my hormones kicked in, and my interests moved to football and girls. I did great with football, not so great with girls. But then the Cuban Missile Crisis hit, and we thought we were goners. All I could think of was kissing as many girls as possible before we actually were gone. Thank you, Mr. Khrushchev. And then, the very next year, the president was shot. For the first time in my life, I felt there was something very wrong with my country. A few years later, the Watts riots erupted. I wondered why, in the best country in the world, people would destroy their own neighborhoods. Good evening. Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. Two months after that, Bobby Kennedy took a bullet. Campuses erupted over the Vietnam War and students were killed. I got my body beat and my head bloodied. Times were crazy, incredibly crazy. But then, right in the middle of all this, Peggy came back into my life. It was, well, love at second sight. My bomb shelter girl had turned into a bombshell. We went to the same college and quickly became inseparable. We went on trips together, had coffee together. We danced to no music and wrote silly love notes to each other. We had our ups and downs, but couldn't ever imagine our lives being apart. She was constantly in my thoughts, and I in hers. She was the love of my life. I knew it in my very being, and I knew I would always be with her. Until one day. She was shot dead, along with half a dozen other students. I helped bury Peggy a week later. It was the hardest thing I'd ever done. I never got over Peggy. A crazy person on prescription drugs ended her life and took a big chunk of mine. After Peggy's death, I decided to pay my Uncle John a visit. I always loved going to his farm, but when I arrived, everything was different. It used to be a small, old-fashioned, organic farm. Now there were just rows of corn, nothing but corn. There were only a few birds. The fireflies had vanished. Nature was unnaturally silent. About the only reminder of the old farm was a calf named Bessie, who I bonded with immediately. She had the softest, kindest eyes I'd ever seen. Bessie was my new girl. 
John used to make his fertilizer from compost heaps. Now he used fertilizer made from natural gas, which didn't seem very natural to me. He told me his pesticides came all the way from the Middle East because they were made from oil. I put my hand in some of that new fertilizer just to feel it, and John scolded me. He said there were waste products in there. He told me toxic sludge was good for his fields. At least that's what the salesman told him. John was never the sharpest tool in the shed, so I later found out what made his fertilizer so special. Of course, having your food grown in toxic sludge doesn't sound very appetizing, so a bunch of corporate PR people came up with some other names. They finally settled on biosolids as a way to disguise the hazardous waste. Dumping hazardous waste in farm fields was against the law, so lobbyists had the government change its classification of sewage sludge from a hazardous waste to a Class A fertilizer. And just like that, millions of farms and backyard gardens were turned into little hazardous waste dumps. I asked John why he had to keep spraying pesticides on his crops. He said only about 10% actually stayed on the crops. The rest of it ended up in streams and rivers, or the wind carried it for hundreds of miles. I guess that's one reason we all have more than a dozen pesticides inside our bodies. He then told me he had cancer. So did other farmers in the area. Farmers have an unusually high rate of certain types of cancer. Nearby towns had high rates too, as well as birth defects, brain damage, and Parkinson's disease. Uncle John's farm had changed. Artificial fertilizer had replaced natural, chemical pesticides had replaced natural, and disease had replaced health down on the farm. Nothing like the smell of poison in the morning. Ten days after I graduated from college, I got my notice to report for a physical. They still had the draft back then. I was drafted like so many others and was lucky I didn't come home in a bag. Bobby and Joey weren't so lucky. When I returned to the States, I got the first shockwave of the future, a full-blown energy crisis. I was stunned to learn that a small group of men could bring our entire nation to its knees. I went to graduate school in Boston. I can remember watching a tape of Eisenhower's farewell speech where he warned of a growing military-industrial complex. It was small back then compared to what it is today. I also remember a professor telling me about how a small group of corporations, around 500, controlled over two-thirds of our economy. He explained that most people think these large corporations are good. They think of free markets. They think of entrepreneurship. Most of all, they think of jobs. But these corporations are just the opposite. They'll do anything to kill free markets and destroy competition. And they're first in line when it comes to government handouts. They'd rather hire a bunch of robots than people. That's one reason why they control two-thirds of the economy, but only employ 10% of the people. It's the businesses without Washington connections that employ the rest of us. But the story about corporations with Washington connections gets a lot stranger. The Supreme Court has actually turned corporations into legal persons with full-blown constitutional rights, just like you and me. What's stranger still is that these rights were given to corporations under the 14th Amendment, which was supposed to guarantee human rights to newly freed slaves. Slaves used to be property, but now property, in the form of corporations, has become human. Despite the fact corporations do not have the same morals or motivations as individual citizens, the Supreme Court cannot tell the difference between General Motors and the general public. Thanks to the Supreme Court, we now have a sort of superhuman because corporations can live forever, 
They can't be jailed, and they have no conscience or morals, and yet they enjoy virtually all the rights that humans have. With a few strokes of the pen, corporations suddenly entered the human race. And just recently, the Supreme Court ruled that corporations could give unlimited support to political candidates under their rights to free speech. Seems to me that with all that money, they have a lot more free speech than I do. Especially since politicians who spend the most money almost always win. And yet, with all these rights, the one right these corporation people do not have is the right to vote. Of course, 500 votes wouldn't amount to much anyway, but they don't need to vote. With all that money, they can just purchase politicians to do their voting for them. In school, I'd learned that one person equals one vote, but in the real world, I've come to learn that many dollars equals many votes, and that doesn't sound like democracy to me. When I first heard all this, I got so angry, I called up Bill, my grade school class president, because he was just elected to Congress. His staff gave me such a runaround, I never got hold of him. They said he was out campaigning. But the way my professor explained it, if you had enough money, politicians like Bill could be bought to do anything, just like a prostitute. And the more he talked, the more it sounded like our Capitol building was the best little cat house in the nation. Uh, oh, come on, I, I need, I need the money. I, I gotta pay the rent. I gotta, I gotta feed the monster. Okay, look, I'll, I'll do, I'll do whatever it takes. Okay, I, I just need the money. Yeah, yes, I'll vote for it. Look. I don't like doing this, okay? But I gotta pay f rent. You know, I've got babies to take care of. Gotta feed the monster. I'll do anything for money. I gotta pay the monster. I'll do anything for money. Anything. I'll do whatever needs to be done if the price is right, you know what I mean? I gotta pay the rent. I gotta feed the monster. You pay me, I'll do whatever you want. I'll do whatever it takes, okay? I, I just need the money. I call Bill and his other friends in Washington politutes. Let, let's meet in like a half hour. You see, in exchange for party favors, these politutes give corporations a very good time. Billions in subsidies and a lot more in other benefits, like drilling holes in laws and regulations. Some so big you could drive a toxic waste truck through them. That's how those toxic chemicals got into Uncle John's fertilizer. That's why 5% of the population owns more wealth than the other 95%. That's why more than 90% of our major corporations pay less than 5% of their income in taxes. If corporations paid their fair share of taxes, like you and I do, we could eliminate the national debt and increase needed services with a government that served the people, not wealthy corporations. I don't mind prostitution so long as it doesn't hurt anyone. But in Washington, it seems prostitution always does. Now, don't get me wrong. Most of the businesses out there are honest and ethical. It just seems that the bigger they get, the more corrupt they become. Turns out that my grade school buddy Foster achieved his lifelong dream and became the CEO of one of these big corporations. I tried calling him one day to find out why he didn't pay any taxes. His secretary said he didn't know who I was and hung up on me. I always thought Foster was a little crazy but I read in the papers he got really crazy running that big company. Some clever people did a psychological profile of corporations since they are, according to our Supreme Court, human beings with constitutional rights. That psychological profile seemed to fit Foster like a T. Turns out, these are the traits of a psychopath. In fact, 
corporations are the epitome of everything that's wrong with human nature without actually being human. Over the years, I've seen a lot of psychopaths on TV who claim to be innocent, and some who got away with it. Just like psychopaths, corporations never admit their guilt because it would cut into profits. And just like criminals, big corporations lie about their crimes all the time. That's because they break the law all the time. Here's a small sampling of fines levied against corporations for criminal activities. Corporations actually cause more damage to society than all the street crimes put together, whether it's people killed, property damaged, or fraud. Their attitude? Crime is just a cost of doing business. But unlike other criminals, they get to change laws so they're not even thrown in jail. Because of all their partying, the penalty is usually a fine, or they have to give more money to politutes. Foster's company paid $10 million in fines for a crime he committed, but his company made $3 billion, and he never went to jail. Corporations don't really care about the consequences of turning a buck, and they have a long history of not caring. Just look how IBM helped the Nazis organize their concentration camps with ID systems, so Jews could be killed more efficiently. Or how General Motors helped build vehicles for the German military. The Rockefeller Foundation helped finance human experiments in Nazi death camps. And a lot of other corporations helped the Nazi regime as well. Like a true psychopath, none of them cared about the consequences of turning a Nazi buck. Remember Love Canal? Some corporation dumped 20,000 tons of toxic waste into a landfill covered it up and then sold the land to the city for just a dollar. That corporate generosity seemed like a deal too good to be true. It was. 25 years later, those barrels full of chemicals started leaking and kids came home with burns all over their bodies. That was followed by miscarriages, birth defects, cancer, and other diseases. For generations, of course, the corporation denied any wrongdoing, and the government backed them up. They said something else must have caused all those health problems. Monsanto poisoned an entire Alabama town with toxic waste and didn't tell anyone because, in their words, we can't afford to lose one dollar of business. Decades after PCB production stopped, the town remains one of the most polluted in America. And there are thousands of Anistons throughout the U.S. and world. Not wanting to lose one dollar in business is why PCBs and other chemicals are now found in polar bears and just about every living being on Earth, including humans. And not wanting to lose a single dollar is the story of how a toxic waste product was magically turned into an ingredient that supposedly fights tooth decay. Sodium fluoride is a waste product of the aluminum and fertilizer industries, and it's expensive to get rid of because it's extremely toxic. So toxic, it's used as a rat poison. A long time ago, the aluminum industry put on this big PR campaign based on phony studies that were designed to convince the public and the government that dumping this industrial waste into our drinking water would reduce tooth decay. Guess what? The government and public bought it. And now, instead of properly disposing of their toxic waste, these industries actually turn a profit by selling their waste to municipal water companies. The only problem, there isn't a shred of scientific evidence that dumping this stuff into drinking water reduces tooth decay. Europeans don't drink rat poison, and their teeth are just fine. 
so too are the teeth of citizens in the U.S. who don't fluoridate their water. The fact is, tooth decay is simply a matter of oral hygiene. You know how they have warnings on cigarettes? They also have warnings on toothpaste. Imagine that, a rat poison that reduces tooth decay. Remember when the car industry created a propaganda campaign against taking lead out of gas? And continued the blitz even after it was proven that lead pollution was killing 5,000 people a year and wreaking havoc on the health of millions more, while creating lifelong stupidity in millions of children. Once lead was taken out of gas, the lead blood levels in Americans plunged by 75%. What did the oil companies do? In typical psychopathic fashion, they continued selling leaded gas in countries outside the U.S., knowing full well the consequences of their actions. So long as they can save a fraction of a penny on every gallon of gas, they don't care about the consequences. And who can forget the Exxon Valdez oil spill? Those corporate lawyers were so clever, they turned it into a case of drunk driving on the high seas, and thus human error, not corporate error. Only problem with that explanation is that the captain was sleeping in off when the ship crashed, and a competent sailor was at the helm. The reason the ship went off course is that Exxon hadn't repaired one of its radars in over a year to save money. Had it been working, the tanker could have avoided that reef and 11 million gallons of oil would not be on the shore. Exxon was fined $5 billion, but they fought that for 20 long years until their friends in the Supreme Court ruled they only had to pay half a billion. Imagine that, a 90% savings. And after 20 years in court, a third of the native Alaskans were dead so Exxon only had to pay a fraction of that award. The oil from that crash still remains, and Exxon doesn't have to clean it up. You can turn over a rock and it smells like an old gas station. The mess is still there. 19 years after the spill, Exxon was the most profitable corporation in U.S. history. These and other environmental disasters are not accidents, but the result of a corporate system which turns otherwise law-abiding men and women into loony psychopaths whose only concern is the bottom line. When corporations are free to regulate themselves, the Niger Delta is what you get. This area has experienced the equivalent of an Exxon Valdez oil spill every year for the last 50 years, and it continues today and the oil corporations there don't care. Here are a few of the more well-known environmental disasters we have experienced. These are infamous, but pollution goes on every day in far bigger ways. It's well known that rates of cancer, asthma, emphysema, and other lung diseases are higher in smoggy cities and worse still in neighborhoods that include heavily trafficked highways. Why then has no car or oil company ever had to pay a cent to cover the medical costs their products have caused? Because they purchase friends in high places and don't care about the consequences of turning a buck. Taxpayers will clean up their mess and give the automobile and oil industries a hidden subsidy worth trillions of dollars. I visited Uncle John's farm again. My uncle had died after a long battle with cancer, enjoying the soil he loved so much. His son Ned had taken over the farm. I saw Bessie. She was a full-grown girl now and remembered me. She still had that soft spark in her eyes. The place looked the same, but now half the corn was going to make high fructose corn syrup. Ned said he could make more money feeding people than feeding livestock. The other half was to make ethanol to feed automobiles. He said it would make the country less dependent on fossil fuels. 
I couldn't help but think the fertilizer, pesticides, and herbicides were all derivatives of oil. It didn't make much sense to drench the fields with oil to make us less dependent on oil. I asked Ned what happens when oil gets really expensive. He just shrugged his shoulders and said biofuels were very profitable, but only thanks to government subsidies. As I was leaving, I noticed that Ned was growing flowers. Thought he'd gone soft on me, but there's some good money selling flowers to all those romantics. Nearby, I noticed something else, a bunch of beehives. They'd come all the way from Australia. I thought that was crazy. He told me the bees were dying off. I looked at him and said, so are the people. I never did get through to my high-powered friends, Bill and Foster, but years later, I decided to call Melissa. I had a little crush on her in the sixth grade. She even wore my ring around her neck. But then I caught her with Nick. She had a thing about bad boys back then. I hated Nick. To get revenge, I started a He-Man Woman Haters Club and went back to my accordion. But now, Melissa was this big time economist. Well, she not only took my call, but actually remembered who I was. We even had a laugh about Nick. I told her about Bill and Foster. But the reason I called was my concern about all this growing corporate power. Well, I could tell that got her going, and she talked my ear off. She told me that one of the basic problems with corporations is that, like some monster, they have to keep growing in order to survive. This corporate survival instinct is what's transformed our lives since the middle of the 20th century. In the 1950s, the U.S. economy could satisfy everyone's physical needs. Not coincidentally, national happiness was at its highest at that time. The problem for big corporations became how to keep growing when everyone's physical needs were met. To solve this problem, corporations decided to manufacture desire in the consumer so they would feel they need more than they actually do need. What they found was that, whereas human needs are finite, human desires are infinite. So the manufacture of infinite desires became the basis for generating infinite profits. Creating desires is the reason American adults now see more advertisements in one year than people saw in a lifetime 50 years ago. Creating desires is the reason American children will see 100,000 television ads by the age of five and will see another two million before they die. It's also the reason we get 87 billion pieces of junk mail, 51 billion telemarketing calls, and 84 billion spam emails every year. Not content with just the U.S. market, Corporations took their growth policy global and turned breastfeeding moms into formula-loving moms, created a desire for Western goods in primitive places, and left environmental destruction and massive health problems in their wake. There are a couple of big problems with infinite growth. One, the Earth's capacity to absorb the waste and pollution caused by all this growth is finite and we're fast approaching those limits. Two, the resources of the earth are finite and we are fast approaching those limits. Economic growth throughout the world has accelerated so fast that in just the last 30 years, we've consumed a third of the planet's natural resources. We've now depleted 60% of the world's forests, farmlands, rivers, lakes, and grasslands. Half the world's forests are now completely gone. They've been wiped off the face of the planet. At current rates of depletion, we'll run out of seafood by 2048. For the first time in history, the demands placed on the Earth are now far greater than its ability to regenerate its resources. 
Most people think this is because of the world population explosion, but that's only a small part of the picture. The richest 20% of the world's population account for over 80% of the material and energy consumed globally, while the poorest 20% account for just 1% of consumption. Damage to the earth is unequivocally caused by excessive consumption by the richest 20% of humans pursuing unnecessary desires. In other words, as people become richer, their consumption patterns cause a disproportionate amount of damage to the earth. Another problem with infinite growth is pollution, because when we pollute the environment, we pollute ourselves and every other living being on the planet. In the last 40 years, corporations in the U.S. have spewed more than two tons of toxic chemical wastes into the environment for each man, woman, and child. There's so much pollution that fog, rain, and snow contain toxic waste. Forty percent of waterways in the U.S. have become unfishable, unswimmable, or undrinkable, and eighty percent are contaminated with drugs. Even birds on isolated islands in the Arctic are contaminated. Today, virtually every single living being is polluted, and human bodies are now as polluted as our rivers. The average person has over 250 industrial chemicals inside their body. It's little wonder that all this pollution is the cause of over 200 diseases and 40% of all deaths. Babies are now born with more than 200 contaminants in their blood, including mercury, fire retardants, and pesticides. More than a third of all diseases in children under five are now caused by environmental toxins. Because this is happening over time, almost in slow motion, we've become used to living with heavy pollution, and we're used to reading about two-year-olds with brain cancer. We simply shake our heads and wonder how that could happen. We rightly get upset when coal miners are killed, but that's nothing compared to the mercury pollution from coal plants, which is linked to 60,000 cases of brain damage in newborn children every year, just in the U.S. Even wild animals are now getting cancer. The average sperm counts in men around the world have dropped by more than half over the past 50 years due to pollutants. Worst still, it's been discovered that environmental diseases can be passed from one generation to the next. Your grandmother's exposure to an industrial poison 50 years ago can affect you today. Take a look at the diseases that are linked to our polluted environment. The top 3,000 corporations in the world cause over $2 trillion in pollution and environmental damage every year. And that does not include health costs. And they don't pay a dime for the damage they cause. The Earth, in other words, is providing a massive subsidy for corporate profits. Everything from trees to honeybees are free subsidies for them. 
So what would happen if we added these hidden costs to the price of oil, for example? According to a number of studies, the real cost of a barrel of oil in the U.S. comes in around $480 a barrel, or $11 a gallon at the pump, instead of just three. Now, if you take into account environmental, health, and climate change costs, the whole ballgame changes. When you add these factors to the equation, the real cost of a barrel of oil comes in around $8,000 which puts a gallon of gas at about 400. That would mean $6,000 to fill up your SUV. Compared to oil, solar technologies are cheap because most of these costs go away. And we don't have to send our military out to protect the sun. Right now the earth is an open sewer for businesses to dump their pollution. And we let them do this for free. Here's another example, our extremely rich diet. What if we added all the hidden costs to a pound of beef? Add up all these hidden costs and you're paying $815 a pound. We definitely can't afford that steak. Why so much? Here are just a few reasons. According to Melissa, everything from energy to our eating habits have massive hidden costs. We're not paying for those costs now, but we will be in the not too distant future. I recently had the honor of meeting a Holocaust survivor. We spent a few hours together as I wanted to know about his experiences. I asked blunt questions. He gave me equally blunt answers. He experienced firsthand the cruel lesson that, under the right circumstances, humans are capable of anything. I'll never forget that conversation. In some ways, it reminded me of an event that changed my life. My old grade schoolmate, Jake, ended up owning a meatpacking house. It was a meatpacking house that inspired Henry Ford to come up with his assembly line for automobiles. Hitler, in turn, was inspired by Henry Ford's methods. I was out drinking with Jake one night, and he dared me to spend an hour on his kill floor. Not one to turn down a dare, I took him up on it. The next morning, I met Jake outside a slaughterhouse. He told me to walk through this tunnel that they were expecting me on the other side. The stench turned my stomach. I could hear the cries of cattle being slaughtered. As I entered the room, I couldn't believe my eyes. It was Bessie. She was hanging upside down, the blood from her throat collecting in a rusty metal bucket. She gave me a terrified look as I stood there helpless. I ordered the man to let her down. I hugged her in a pool of blood as she gasped her last breath. Ned had sold her to a factory farm. She was worked constantly, artificially impregnated to keep her producing milk. Her calves were taken from her. The males were put in tiny crates where they could not move, to make veal. The females were raised to be constantly milked, like Bessie was then killed and butchered. From that point on, I decided I would never eat an animal or dairy product again. And then the strangest thing happened. I felt compelled to go back to the kill floor, where I looked those animals in the eye as they were slaughtered, one after the next after the next. With billions of animals systematically slaughtered every year, 
What I witnessed was nothing short of an animal holocaust. I think everyone should have a garden to see how their food is harvested. I also think everyone should go to a slaughterhouse for the same reason. I don't expect everyone to do what I've done, but there are some things I'll never understand, like people who clearly do not need food, people with such low self-esteem they feel compelled to kill innocent defenseless animals with high-powered rifles. There's too much violence in the world. It reminds me of something that happened a long time ago. As I journey into the future, I can't help but think that corporate exploitation of nature, purely for profit, is becoming all too complete. I was reminded of that when I paid a visit to a high school friend, Maggie. Like me, she was getting up there in years. Life hadn't been good to her. She was barely making it on her pension, but she was happy. When we talked, she told me a story I still have a hard time believing. Her family had a history of breast cancer and she suspected she might be predisposed to the disease. She went to her doctor to be tested, but that test was outrageously expensive. She couldn't afford it. Seems that some biotech corporation owns the patents on the genes that may cause that breast cancer. They also own the patent for testing those genes. In other words, they have a monopoly on her genes. Her doctor said the test was easy, but he couldn't violate their patent, so she was stuck. Maggie died of breast cancer just four years later. I don't know if that test could have saved her, but it would have given her an early warning for sure. But this is what's really strange. Since that corporation has a patent on Maggie's genes, they also own the rights not only to Maggie's genes, but to the genes of all other women. In other words, women no longer own their own genes. They belong to some corporation. No one can touch her genes without their permission. So, if you were to take those genes out of your body, for example, that corporation could sue you for patent infringement. And thanks to our Supreme Court, the same one that gave corporations all that power and all those human rights, not only genes, but nature itself can now be patented and actually owned by corporations. Thanks to our Supreme Court, we now have a bunch of corporate psychopaths in charge of nature. All this reminded me of seeding time on Uncle John's farm. Seeds are the very foundation of civilization. In the old days, farmers would buy and trade seeds, but those days are going fast. Because corporations are replacing natural seeds with genetically altered seeds and taking over the market. Before John died, he tried some of those hybrid seeds. He found out he couldn't sell or trade them because this corporation had a patent on the seed, just like another corporation had a patent on Maggie's genes. And because of another one of those Supreme Court decisions, this big corporation could make John sign an end-user license for the seeds. Now, John can't even collect seeds from his own harvest and replant them, or he would be guilty of patent infringement. And guess who wrote that strict user license? Nick. Yes, my old grade school bully. He's now this big lawyer working for this biotech company. Instead of bullying kids around, he's bullying farmers. Nick's sales lady told John his crop wouldn't require as much weed killer and pesticide, and that would save him money. It didn't work out that way. In fact, it took a lot more. John never liked that sales lady. They used to argue a lot. He always thought she looked like a bug. He felt like giving her some of her own medicine. One big problem is that these altered seeds could blow into a neighbor's field and start growing without anyone knowing it. Well, Nick goes out to investigate crops with his gene police. 
he found that some of John's hybrid seed had spread to his main corn crop. He threatened to fine John for patent infringement and take over his crop. In most cases, farmers just settle because they don't have the money or time to fight the bully. John and Nick always got into an argument over that contract. But there was one farmer Nick couldn't get to, David, the boy he used to beat up on at school. Nick would come around and try to bully David, but David knew his rights and threw him off his farm. Nick, of course, was in no shape to beat up anyone. All he had left was a big mouth and belly. But Nick loved his job and loved harassing farmers until he died of a heart attack. But what Nick represented was far more sinister than just bullying farmers. Due to lobbying efforts, biotech corporations pressured the government into saying that genetically engineered food is no different than regular food. So these corporations don't have to prove this engineered food is safe, but it's not. It causes allergies in humans at a minimum and organ damage in animals. Animals have died from eating hybrid corn. Others became sterile. If it makes animals sick, you won't find me eating it. It's becoming harder to avoid eating altered food unless you eat purely organic. Currently about 75% of processed and packaged foods are genetically engineered. For the first time in history, we're bypassing the natural limits set down by nature. They're moving genes between animals, bacteria, viruses, plants, and humans. We're testing Murphy's Law because something's going to go wrong with all this, and probably within the next 20 years. They're even planning for it. They've created this doomsday seed bank where they're storing all the traditional seed they can, just in case. It's like kids playing with tinker toys or adults playing roulette. Who are you going to trust? Farmers who have a 10,000 year history of safe food? Or a bunch of money hungry corporations using experimental food that's never been proven to be safe? Monsanto first polluted the world with PCBs. Now it's polluting the world with genetically altered food and some ugly stuff is going to hit the fan down the road. One Sunday morning, I decided to walk down to the park. Several generations were there, but the newest generation caught my attention because I was concerned about their future. Unlike when I was growing up, the imprint of human overconsumption has now grown so large that it's threatening the Earth's resources. I looked around and things didn't seem too bad. It's only when you compare what exists now to what existed just 100 years ago that you realize we're living in a very depleted environment. We humans are the most destructive species ever to visit the Earth and the dumbest because we think we can destroy our own habitat without consequence. We're now plundering the planet at a pace that will soon outstrip its capacity
to support life. Humans are like an alien species using up the Earth's resources as fast as we can. And these young kids will have to deal with the mess we've created during their lifetimes. If current trends hold true, they will face a series of unimaginable crises. The first crisis will be an energy shortage due to declining production and skyrocketing demand as China, India and other countries dramatically increase their consumption of oil. At current and future rates, the last trillion barrels of oil will pretty much be gone within 40 years. In the short term, we're not running out of oil, we're running out of cheap oil. And that will cause fundamental changes in our lives. A shortfall in supply as little as 10 to 15 percent is enough to shatter an oil dependent economy. During the 1970s oil crisis, shortfalls in supply as small as 5 percent caused the price of oil to almost quadruple. The same thing happened with natural gas. In the past, these shortfalls were only temporary. In the future, they'll be permanent. One authority has stated that by 2035, oil production will be down by 75%, gas production by 60%. More than half a million oil-based products will become much more expensive, and this will radically change everything in our lives. Imagine a world where cars are luxury items reserved for the very rich. Sound like the past? What you're imagining is the future. A future where oil products will become prohibitively costly. Think 10, 20, 30 dollars plus per gallon of gas. As a result, all human activity will contract. There will be a downsizing of America for future generations that is difficult for us to imagine. Unfortunately, there is no realistic substitute for oil. Oil in the 20th century was an energy winner. If you invested $1 worth of energy, you would get $20 of energy back. But as oil becomes more difficult to extract, it will become an energy loser. Most of the new energy technologies, such as hydrogen and biofuels, require $20 worth of energy to get $1 back. It requires more energy from traditional fossil fuels to create hydrogen or biofuels than the hydrogen or biofuels produce themselves. These are energy losers. Due to massive hidden costs and subsidies, nuclear has been an energy loser for the past 50 years and there's no reason to think it will suddenly become a winner. And since nuclear waste dumps must last for 10,000 years, about twice as long as mankind's recorded history, that poses a tremendous downside. But even with these problems, we won't be able to build enough nuclear plants in time to solve the coming energy crisis. And building these plants won't be politically possible anyway. There's no such thing as clean coal. It is the dirtiest energy source on the planet. And it, too, is becoming more expensive to extract and rapidly becoming an energy loser. And extracting oil from shale is not only prohibitively expensive, but an environmental disaster to boot. Solar is, no doubt, the closest energy winner we have, but it takes massive amounts of fossil fuels to build and maintain solar technologies. If we built solar thermal plants covering a 100 by 100 mile area in the southwest, the same amount of land which has already been excavated for coal strip mining, it could power the entire nation, 
while slashing greenhouse gas emissions. You have to ask yourself, instead of strip mining for dirty coal, why don't we get smart and go solar? A rapid shift to renewables would not be easy, but World War II demonstrated we have the capability if we have the political will. Just a few months after Pearl Harbor was attacked, a bomber rolled off the line at Willow Run every hour. I've seen a lot of energy schemes come and go, but the one that sticks is solar. We won't be running out of solar in the foreseeable future, and there's no danger an air or sun spill will pollute the environment. What stands in the way of a rapid shift to solar power are powerful corporations that will oppose any attempt to move in that direction, regardless of the costs or consequences. The second and related crisis will be food shortages throughout the world. Someone once said that the industrialization of agriculture is one of the greatest blunders in the history of our species. Why? One reason is that it makes our food production totally dependent on oil. Currently it takes over 400 gallons of oil equivalents to feed just one American every year. Another reason is that repeatedly using oil-based fertilizers degrades the soil. Most of the soil in the Great Plains is now so barren it can't produce crops without oil. Without oil, the breadbasket of America is empty. Unfortunately, we have helped spread industrial agriculture throughout the world. Because of the vastly increased energy input from oil-based fertilizers, this enabled the world to grow more food per acre and feed more mouths. As a result, the world now has over 6 billion people, and by 2050 there will be 3 billion more mouths to feed. More food will have to be produced within the next 50 years than during the last 10,000 years combined, at a time when oil will become less available and much more expensive and at a time when vast amounts of arable land around the world will be turning into desert. Global meat consumption is also expected to double by 2050, which means a massive strain on grain supplies. Humans, in other words, will be competing with livestock for food. Because of these factors, global food supplies will begin to fall short as early as 2020. By 2025, the U.S. will cease to be a food exporter and people around the world, dependent on this export, will begin starving. As oil becomes increasingly expensive, there will be a sharp downturn in production, as farmers throughout the world will be forced to return to traditional agriculture. Cheap oil allowed populations to grow beyond what traditional agriculture could supply. With a return to traditional agriculture, we will not be able to feed even the current level of world population. Population will outstrip food production and future generations will witness mass famines of unimaginable proportions. If we don't find a way to reduce population growth, Nature will. The third crisis will be major breakdowns in ecosystems. Humans have grown in number and technological capability to a point where our presence on the earth is like a planetary disease. We have consumed a third of the planet's natural resources in just the last 30 years and caused massive damage to the ecosystems we need to survive. 
In the last 40 years, biodiversity, the variation of life forms, has plunged by a third, and it will plunge more rapidly in the next 40 years as economic growth accelerates throughout the world. The current extinction rate is now 10,000 times faster than what has historically been recorded as normal. At this rate, humans will practically be the only animal left on Earth after 2100. The fourth crisis will be climate change. There's an old saying that if you put a frog in boiling water, it will jump out and save itself. If you heat the water slowly, however, the frog will boil to death. The earth goes through natural climate cycles, but it seems to me that after pumping all this pollution into the atmosphere, massively altering and removing our planetary forests and vegetative cover, while polluting our oceans and lakes to no end, how could humans not alter the Earth's climate? It's actually very simple. The Earth can handle small amounts of greenhouse gas emissions, as it has when massive volcanic activity occurs. It takes several years before the ash and debris has been absorbed. The Earth is more than capable of handling natural events like these. The problem now is that we have a constant stream of greenhouse gases being pumped into the atmosphere, the equivalent of 1,000 volcanic eruptions every day, 365 days a year. This is like someone smoking 20 packs of cigarettes every day. The Earth cannot handle this amount, and is choking on human pollution. The effects are already showing up with rising oceans, intensifying weather conditions, melting ice caps and glaciers, ocean acidification, diseases spreading more easily, and increasing crop failures. What we are witnessing is a worldwide environmental disaster that's taking place in slow motion, right in front of our eyes. The events taking place that will shape the future have all happened at a relatively slow pace in human time. We won't boil to death, but our children and their children may. The Earth is out of balance due to human activities and rising temperatures will convert enormous areas of our planet into uninhabitable desert while submerging most of our coastlines. If predictions about climate change hold true, the future of our grandchildren and their grandchildren will be nothing less than catastrophic. James Lovelock, a well-respected scientist and radical thinker, has said this about climate change. It is too late to avert catastrophe. Parts of the earth will turn into desert. Other parts will be flooded by rising sea levels. By 2040, the average temperature in European cities will rise to 110 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. The land in Europe will gradually revert to scrub and desert as will much of the western U.S. and other parts of the world. Massive droughts will turn farmlands into dust bowls and burn forests to ashes. Most life on Earth will be wiped out by 2100 due to famine and lack of water. 
the world's population will shrink from 7 billion to 1 billion or less as people compete for ever scarcer resources. As a result, human civilization will collapse. His advice? And while you may dispute Lovelock's predictions, keep in mind that climate change is accelerating three times faster than scientists had predicted. And it will take a thousand years to reverse the changes that have already been triggered. In fact, the biggest fault in scientific predictions is that they have been too conservative. Climate change is coming faster and harder than anyone predicted. The vast hole in the floating ice of the North Polar Ocean that appeared in 2007, for example, was not supposed to appear before 2050. Climate change deniers are either funded by industries which pollute the atmosphere or their corporate ideologies have blinded them to the facts. The oil and coal industries launched a 15-year disinformation campaign designed to confuse the public about climate change and they have used every tactic in the book to obstruct corrective measures. If someone's making a lot of money off something that does harm, they will deny it does harm and hire people to confuse you. Many corporate front groups are funded by the oil, coal, and other polluting industries to put people into a state of denial about climate change. These groups are hired to fight any effort to cut corporate profits. They selectively edit data, take facts out of context, and manufacture their own reality to suit whoever is paying them. I call them infotutes, the poor cousins of politutes. The same tactics were used by the tobacco industry disinformation campaign as millions died from their product. The same tactics were used by industries destroying the ozone layer. The same tactics were used by the automobile and oil companies to fight taking lead out of gas. The asbestos companies, the drug companies, it's all the same. It's simply the behavior of big polluters trying to deny responsibility for what they have caused, because they don't care. People can be bought to say anything, and because of the large sums of money corporations have at their disposal, it will be virtually impossible to overcome their influence. Mother Nature is simply reacting to all this pollution and hack scientists who deny humans had anything to do with climate change all have ties to the industries causing the pollution. It is far more comfortable and profitable to maintain our state of denial and that is what polluting industries are banking on. They still have product on the shelf and they are going to sell it regardless of the cost. The energy stored for millions of years in oil has now polluted the planet and that energy is being expressed in climate change. And if we connect all the dots, the picture is clear. What we call home is fast approaching a breaking point. And the real cost of our reckless way of living will be paid for by future generations. Instead of an American dream, they will be living an American nightmare. All of these crises are developing in such a way that when today's children are in the middle of their lives, the full fury of these crises will start to be felt. Based on current trends, here are just a few snapshots of what this future will look like. By 2020, one quarter of the world's mammals will be extinct. By 2020, Less rainfall will reduce agricultural yields by up to 50% in some parts of the world. By 2020, demand for oil will exceed supply, causing oil shortages and large spikes in prices. By 2030, virtually every country will face shortages of fresh water. By 2030, 
60% of all coral reefs will be gone. By 2030, Arctic summers will be ice-free. By 2030, ice sheets in Greenland will begin rapidly melting and sea levels will rise. By 2030, many areas of the world will experience continuous drought. By 2030, oil shortages become more severe, sending industrial economies into permanent recession. By 2030, suburbs throughout the world begin collapsing due to the increased cost of transportation, which causes mass migrations into cities. By 2030, a farming region in China's north that produces food for 400 million will run out of water due to the depletion of aquifers. By 2040, the Ogallala Aquifer will be dry and dust bowl conditions will become permanent in the Midwest. Similar results will occur throughout the rest of the world as aquifers dry up. By 2040, honeybee populations will cease to exist. By 2040, a widespread disaster will happen involving genetic engineering, which will threaten food supplies. By 2040, oil shortages become permanent sending industrial economies into depression. By 2040, resource wars over oil, water, and food will break out throughout the world. By 2040, social unrest and rioting due to resource shortages affect almost every country. Many governments collapse under the pressure. By 2050, the world population will be over 9 billion people. By 2050, more than 2 billion people won't have access to clean water. By 2050, virtually all tropical rainforests will be gone. By 2050, almost all coral reefs will be gone. By 2050, phytoplankton, the base of all marine life, will be greatly reduced due to warmer oceans. By 2050, there will be a global collapse of all currently exploited fish. By 2050, polar bears will mostly be found in zoos. By 2050, permanent drought conditions will be experienced in many areas of the world. By 2050, over 2 billion people will be subject to severe flooding. By 2050, most coastal cities will be under severe attack from rising sea levels. By 2050, rising sea levels will devour 17% of Bangladesh's total landmass, leaving at least 20 million people homeless. By 2050, there will be over 200 million climate change refugees throughout the world. By 2050, increases in epidemics and plagues due to changes in ecosystems will kill millions of people. By 2070, the world's oil supply will be gone. By 2080, severe water shortages threaten half the world's population. By 2080, sea levels around New York City will rise by more than three feet. By 2100, glaciers that provide fresh water for more than a billion people will be gone. By 2100, surface permafrost could completely disappear, releasing massive amounts of methane gas into the atmosphere, further accelerating global warming. By 2100, completely new climate zones appear on almost half of the world's land surface, radically transforming the planet.
Societies collapse due to mismanagement by their ruling elites. In our case, the corporate elites have traded the future for immediate profits and have not paid for the consequences of their actions. Cheap oil has greatly raised our material standard of living, but it has also brought us pollution, planetary destruction, deteriorating health, and global warming. Our modern society, the way we live and the way we conduct business, is not sustainable. This means we cannot continue our industrial civilization much longer. And big changes will have to take place in order to avoid complete collapse. All civilizations had weak links, and once those links were broken, they came down like a house of cards. We have many weak links, but the biggest is oil because it affects everything in our modern lives. All the predictions we have shown will come to pass with greater or lesser severity. They are on the way and there's little reason to think they will not arrive. It's simply a matter of time. What we must do now is prepare to mitigate their impacts as best we can. Captain Paul Watson once remarked that earthworms were more important than people because earthworms can live on the planet without people whereas people cannot live on the planet without earthworms. In other words, we are totally dependent upon the ecological systems we are systematically destroying. If they collapse, we collapse. We are on a runaway train with psychopaths at the controls who don't give a damn about the consequences of turning a buck. We are locked into a system which perversely celebrates the destruction of the earth by giving powerful corporations the right to destroy it. Today, the state governs on behalf of moneyed interests, corporate elites, not the interests of the people. Instead of representing the will of the people, government represents the will of big money. The major decisions governing our fate are not being made by human beings, but corporate monsters. This, among other things, has led to massive inequality. Income inequality in the U.S. is now the most extreme of all countries, and the distribution of wealth is even more unequal than income. The wealth of just the 400 richest Americans is more than the combined net worth of half of the U.S. population. The gap in income between rich and poor nations has doubled in the last 40 years. Just 10% of the world's population possesses 84% of the world's wealth. The top 200 wealthiest people in the world control more wealth than the bottom 4 billion people who lack basic sanitation, health care, clean water, adequate food, and education. Every year, more than 10 million people die of malnutrition, avoidable diseases, and hunger. More food is consumed every year by the livestock we eat and the vehicles we drive than people. Yet we don't have the decency to divert the food to the starving. Just $40 billion a year what consumers spend on cosmetics, or just 3% of the wealth of the richest 400 Americans would provide everyone on earth with those basic needs. I remember the homeless man who, in an act of altruism, helped me when I could not help myself. I think our billionaires and our government should act the same way. It's well proven that a lot of money cannot buy happiness but a little for the unfortunate can. Americans think it's somehow wrong to give people something for nothing, despite the fact large corporations freely take natural resources and taxpayer wealth every day. What we need now are more acts of altruism by the rich, because they have already taken from the poor. But altruistic acts by the rich are about as rare as hummingbirds in the Sahara. That must change. 
The damage done to the earth is caused by obsessive overconsumption fueled by the infinite growth model that powers corporations. That must change. Because this place we call home can only be protected by consuming less and reusing more. Unfortunately, the American way of life is not sustainable and has to be negotiated because it is depleting the Earth's resources and polluting the place where I live. And for others to have the American way of life, we will need to find another planet because we're now taking more from this Earth than it can give. In fact, to stop the destructive pace we're on, Americans will have to shrink their ecological footprint by 85%, which means a massive reduction in our standard of living. In other words, unless we make some big changes in the way we live, in the way we conduct business, and in the way we govern, we will self-destruct in the not-too-distant future. In school, I was taught that free markets were the best way for an economy to run. I've since learned that the only free markets left are in political speeches and neighborhood lemonade stands. Free markets have been replaced by political markets manipulated by corporations who purchase politicians. Deregulation is the corporate code word for less competition and more centralization. Today, deregulation has resulted in just six banks controlling two-thirds of the economy. Today, deregulation has resulted in just six corporations controlling 99% of the media. Which means just six corporations control the news most Americans get. The threat is not big government. It's a government controlled by corporate elites hell-bent on downsizing government services so corporations can take them over. Remember Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? They worked beautifully as government institutions until they were turned into private corporations. The wise guys in charge turned them into casinos whose big bets and subprime markets enriched a few insiders and helped crash the entire financial system impoverishing millions. Their next takeover target is Social Security. Corporations argue they should regulate themselves. Problem is, they've proven time and again they cannot act responsibly. In other words, free markets don't work and don't regulate themselves. And a market system that utterly fails to account for environmental and health costs is worthless. We all breathe the same air and share the same planet. If we want to live in a healthy environment, we must get rid of corporate influence in Washington because it has completely corrupted the political system and we're not capable of doing what needs to be done. If we are going to have any chance of providing a decent future for our children, we must make the government responsive to the people, not wealthy corporations. At a minimum, we have to do the following.
In my humble middle-class existence, I've led a life far better than most kings. I've been very fortunate to have experienced what I have. I've learned that we are part of the earth and it is part of us. The earth does not belong to us, we belong to the earth. If we are to provide our children with a viable future, we must learn to cooperate with Mother Nature because she is both stronger and smarter than we are. We must return to a simpler life on a voluntary basis or Mother Nature will force us to. We are her sons and daughters and she's more powerful than all of us combined. When I look at pictures, I see the past. When I look at children, I see the future. As I look back on my life, what strikes me most is how fast it has gone. We are here but such a short time. We must all think about how our lives impact not only those we share this earth with, but those who will arrive in the future. We must realize that our desire for more things may be limitless, but our actual needs are very few. And true happiness needs few things. I don't presume to know the course of my life, but I do know most of it is gone, and I will be saying goodbye to the world soon. When I'm gone, I'll miss the people I know and those I don't. I'll miss the animals. I'll miss the rainy days and sunshine. I'll miss the lakes, the forests, the mountains and oceans. And I'll miss the music. Mine has been a truly beautiful life, more beautiful than most. But my life has an ugly underbelly because it was made possible by a system which damages the environment and the lives of people and animals damage I was blissfully unaware of for most of my life. And so I pray for future generations that with change, they will be able to lead a life that is different from mine. A life in concert with nature, a life that does not destroy, but appreciates and regenerates nature in all of its wonderful expressions. And if they do that, their lives will be far more beautiful than mine.